Welcome to the first video of five on the subject of the inductance load line or sometimes called the dynamic path of operation. Today I'm going to talk about the inductive load line and why it's important to the power amplifier des output design. This is the first of five videos. We'll get to the other four in the next few videos. There are four books you need. Uh, one written by Albert Priceman, another which is the Radio Designer's Handbook by Langford Smith, and the last one by uh, Richard Maddock, Graphical Analysis of Electronic Circuits, written in 1969, 1953, 1943. There's one magazine article, actually it's a two-part magazine article, written by Norman Crowhurst, How an Output Transformer Causes Distortion. What caught my surprise was when I was reading through this was some of the work I was doing on guitar amps and monitoring the current and voltage on my oscilloscope. I started seeing some anomalies that I didn't understand. They're there, but what's causing them? And that just led me clear straight into this whole subject. Now then, why 1943 and a 1953 and a 1969 book? Because back in their 40s and 50s, uh, those authors, engineers, and some with doctorates, uh, comprised a lot of material and they show all their work. They just didn't say, trust us, here's the uh, blobule uh, equation for the all-inclusive calculation. They showed their work. And as you go through the calculations, you can tell in each step what's being done, why it's being done, and what is going on. Are they handling electricity, uh, inductive, uh, capacitors, you know, they showed their work and explained it along the way, complete with illustrations and figures. That was commonplace in the 40s and 50s. 1969, we started getting away from it somewhat. This is this straight brute math. Basic math. If you have at least sixth grade math, you can follow all this stuff. So I highly recommend the first three. Uh, you can download them in PDF form. A book by Matic. You can get it online. It's like 83 bucks. Uh, get it. The DC load line. When we're designing tube amps or transistor uh, power finals, we, we calculate the DC load line. There's two numbers that we need to actually plot the line, current and voltage. And uh, we do that and we get the DC load line in order to determine where the bias point is. Where is the idle point for the particular tube that we're operating? And we don't want it to be above the... the plate dissipation window for the tube because this will only dissipate so much power and if it gets too hot it shortens the life and does other some strange stuff which is not always good. And then there's the AC load line. An AC load line uh, with a DC load line, let me make one point clear, we, we turn off the capacitors and anything else is reactive. It's just DC. And then we back calculate with an AC load line. We actually look at the calculation for a particular frequency and typically that's going to be 400 Hertz for a guitar amp. If you have radio work or you have stereo work, you may actually want to do your center calculation for that bias point as some other frequency that represents probably the midpoint of the span of frequencies that you want to amplify. So for a guitar amp, 400 hertz, that's where I do my work. Really what this AC load line is, is a back check to the DC load line. I'm going to show you why in just a moment. An inductor introduces a new problem. An inductive load line, it's going to tell us four things that we need to know. We need to know something about overheating, something about clipping, something about distortion, and something about oversaturation, which is a type of distortion as well. I get the feeling that most people don't pursue this because quite frankly, I'll be honest with you. You need to know something about the output transformer. You need to have speaker curves. You need values for current and voltage for all that. You need to uh, have about 450 calculations on a spreadsheet to uh, 
build this uh, spreadsheet, which I showed you in my very first teaser video last time, and you're going to need, therefore, some computing power. And that just seems oppressive, and it's kind of like, oh, I'm okay up till now, why do I need it? Well, I'm going to show you why you need it. I'm also going to explain on the very last slide why your guitar amp sounds the way it does. It's because of these four things, and we'll just, I'm going to discuss that some more for you. Any two. I'm showing an EL34 here. This could be a triode. This could be a trans, uh, a transistor. It doesn't matter. What is important here is what's connected to the output, to the plate. In a DC load line, we consider the plate uh, resistor. It helps us set the bias. And it's a linear line, not because it's straight. It's linear because for any given value of plate current, there's one and only one value for the plate voltage. It's linear. This is easy peasy. It's just sixth grade, add and subtract, multiply and divide type math. The AC load line now considers the tone stack. Right? Oh, okay, that's going to get kind of complicated because there's a lot of resistors and capacitors, right? Let's ignore that. What if you just have one capacitor from the pre, uh, first stage preamp to the second stage preamp? Actually, what you're doing is putting two 12AU7s, uh, first stage, second stage, and let's say all you do is put a, from the plate to the grid of the next stage, you just put a capacitor in. Let's keep it simple. It's still a linear type of calculation. Add, subtract, multiply, and divide. Because the reason it's linear, this, this charges up like a battery. Everyone understands that. And that makes it friendly for a lot of folks. I can calculate that. And for any value of voltage, there's one and only one time constant. This is in seconds. This is in voltage. Here's a charge and discharge cycle of that capacitor. And then when we want to calculate the reactance value, there's just one simple calculation that we do for that. This is where there's some intrepidation. We start looking at an inductive load line. It's nonlinear. It's something that we attach to the plate to get sound out from the plate of the power trans uh, uh, power tube to the power the output uh, transformer to the speaker is this inductor. There's really only one inductor. It is the speaker. The transformer doesn't enter into this. I'll discuss that in subsequent videos. It has nothing to do with this. The problem is the speaker, and that's in, that inductor is uh, nonlinear. You also have base load antennas with this in radio work. That means, the reason it's nonlinear is that for any given value of plate current, there is possibly two values of voltage. For any given value of plate voltage, there's, there's two values for plate current. It's nonlinear. For you mathematicians out there, this is nonlinear, the other two are linear. And as soon as you mention the word nonlinear, people sort of glaze over like a jelly donut. Let me complicate this a little bit more. Probably all know that capacitor start, uh, stores energy like a battery. We get that. Hook up a battery, discharges. Get that. This stores energy differently. This stores energy in the inductor stores energy in a magnetic field. And that magnetic field uh, generates and collapses and generates and collapses. If you look at my prime, uh, the root causes for uh, EMI and, and hum and buzz for a guitar amp, I'll dis I discussed that at length there. I won't do it here. But then you look at magnetic field and then people really, that's where they check out and go, I, I'm fine. I don't need to know that. Well, I want to kind of make this sign a little bit more simple for you. Don't, we won't need to know about magnetism in this vi video series. Here's what we do. You get a tube amp design. Here's a fender. The preamp from the plate to a capacitor to the grid, to a capacitor, to the grid, to a capacitor, to the grid, to the plate, to the output transformer and speaker. From this plate, you can do your AC load line just probably based on this one capacitor. 
you can be a little bit more sophisticated and work in this tone stack to load that plate down. Once you go out this grid to this plate, there's another uh, DC blocking capacitor to this next grid. From here, again, a capacitor out the plate, a capacitor from the uh, cathode into the grids of the class AB amplifier. Now then, DC load line, AC load line, DC load line, AC load line, DC load line, AC load line, DC load line, inductive load line. Okay, we can get through this. That's what this video series is about, to tell you how to do this. This is your typical transistor tube. This, this is the DC load line is always required. The AC load line, when you have the capacitor, we need to block DC current going from one stage to the next. And this is why I say the AC load line is kind of a back check. It's not really required. It doesn't change a lot. People will do the DC uh, load line calculation. I'm going to leave that for other videos and other websites for you to go study how to do this. But you will, it's important to understand how to calculate DC load line because it is the major axis to the inductive load line, as I'll show you in the next several videos. You need to know that. You need to know nothing about the AC load line. There, I did it. I took away one thing you have to know. You don't need to know anything about the AC load line for the inductive load line. So I simplified it for you. Just want to put that out there. And generally we set the bias to where it's underneath the power line uh, for the heat dissipation uh, wattage for the tube. But then we enter in with this inductor. It's also an inductor for a radio antenna or for a guitar amp or a stereo amp, we put this speaker in. Again, the transformer has little to do with the inductive load line. Okay, nothing. Simplified it again. We need the DC load line. We need to do, uh, develop the inductive load line for the speaker because it is putting a load onto the plate and it does so dynamically. And that means as we change frequency, that load's gonna change not just a little, but a lot. Before I get there, I want to welcome you all to Frequency Domain because for the rest of this video, or if you do any other calculations for signal processing in radio work, stereo amplifiers, or guitar amplifiers, you need to do your work in Frequency Domain because it's much simpler. What's the difference? What's on the right is a cartoon. It's an illustration to illustrate something about a single point on this circle over here. It doesn't tell you how this circle operates. What this circle represents is a frequency. It's like a car tire. All this to point out this, that your bias point is the axle what is uh, making your guitar amp sound like it does is what's going on on the perimeter of the wheel. It has nothing very much to do with the axle. It has everything to do with that perimeter. If you were to take a chalk and tape it to the perimeter of the tire and roll the tire so that chalk actually marks on a wall, you would get what you see on the right hand side. Frequency domain frequencies operate in a circle. They do not operate what you see, like what you see on the on the right. This is time domain. This is an illustration to describe again a point on the perimeter. What we're interested in is what's happening on all points on that perimeter. So we get to this. So here's your tire again on the a tube characteristic chart. And I point this, I, I use that as an illustration because the momentum of the tire, your frequency is forced to the perimeter. It is never on the DC load line. Your amp does not operate there unless it's idle. When the frequency goes to zero, your amp goes to idle, and this is how much current that amp is idling. It will always be there. When you put a frequency into the amplifier, depending on the frequency, then determines how big the wheel gets, then you operate around the perimeter. Let me go back. This is one cycle. 
one hertz at the frequencies one hertz. If you go around a thousand times a second, it's, a, it's one kilohertz. This is where it makes a difference. So this is the last slide, bear with me. Now I'm gonna to explain to you why your guitar amp sounds the way it does or what you can do, what you should be looking for in order to make your stereo amp a little quieter, improve its fidelity. And if you're in radio work, you want none of this happening. Uh, your buddies will tell you about it. FCC may write you. Let me go through this step by step. Let's look at a measure of oversaturation. On the grid line, when the signal's coming in on the grid, it's fluctuating uh, peak to peak voltage. It gets to a point that if, you, if it, the peak to peak voltage gets too much, you're forcing that grid to go above zero. And as soon as you tell that input fre uh, frequency, the, the voltage into the grid to go above zero, it, it won't, it's not going to amplify anymore. Your tube has hit its saturation point. Uh, this point of this ellipse is at 270 degrees. I'll explain to that about that in another video that's coming. But at 270, I've hit my saturation point. So if this is the illustration of what's happening to the sine wave, your tire has developed a flat spot. It's, it's being distorted. So here's 90, 180, 270. It can't go anymore, so it maintains that voltage, or in this case, it's maintaining this voltage until it cycles out of it. So it comes up, it hits a voltage, it stays there, and then goes into the next cycle. One hertz is one time around, a thousand hertz is a thousand times around. But this is what the freak, where the frequency is operating. Clipping. This is the flat spot, spot of your tire. When your grid current hits zero and it, it's forced to go below that, there is no signal out. It's grounded out. It is clipped. To me, that is not a distortion. I make a very strong distinction between distortion, which is a symmetry of a signal, versus something that's just being cut off. I've killed the volume, I've killed the output, I have clipped it. This I can deal with, this I can deal with, it's asymmetry, but if it clips too much, then you get something that sounds fuzzy or fizzy. Uh, if you want a fuzz effect, you need more of this. If you don't want the fuzz effect, you want a lot less of this. I'll discuss in other videos how to get rid of this. I've sort of alluded to it in, in a previous video. You don't have an AC load line on this diagram. You, we have now a resistive load line, and I'll discuss more of that But today uh, in another video. The speaker, th this resistive load line, should go through the Q point, the bias point. When it doesn't, like you hooked up your oscilloscope, and you notice, this is why Norman Crowhurst's article is so important. He gives some good examples there. Download that paper and take a look at it, that Magazine Idol article. Let me move myself a little bit out of the way here. Uh, it could be that the speaker is not loading the plate down sufficiently through the output transformer, or the output transformer center tap is a little off. So on the primary side of the output transformer, you have a center tap. This coil and this coil should be identical. If they're slightly different, there's going to be uh, a difference in the impedance between this uh, coil, center tap to leg, and center tap to leg, and that mismatch forces that, these, that resistive load line to veer off of the Q point. And when it does, it makes the signal output asymmetrical it distorts. This is loading distortion. This is distortion because of oversaturation. This is just clipping. Here's my plate dissipation line. Notice in the red area, I'm overheated. I've calculated overheat. Actually, this overheat actually goes up into this blue area here, but there's only so much you can do with graphics. I wanted to illustrate the blue is for, uh, for oversaturation. This red actually goes into this blue area 
uh, above the power line down the straight area that ratio of that area to the whole area of the ellipse gives you a measure of overheating now then when you have tubes in a class this becomes a characteristic of why that guitar amp sounds like it does on uh, the bluesier tube amps, uh, the, your overheating percentage is somewhere around 15%. If they start sounding a little hot, uh, more brittle, it's because the insides have now heated up and they're physically, you're altering the physical characteristics of the uh, grid and plate and they're going to respond a little differently. It may sound a little bit more brittle to you, especially if you overheat the tube at 30%. For most of its life, it also shortens the lifespan. Not something you really want to do in the stereo amp, and not really anything you want in radio amplifiers, although it does occur. You just have to be aware of it. Now, then, class AB, you can tolerate up to 50% overheat because there's two tubes. When this one's processing the positive going signal, this one over here is cooling down. And when this processes the negative going part of the signal, this is cooling down. So for class A operation, you would have zero overheat. For class AB, you can have up to 50% overheat, knowing that 50% of the cycle is cooling down. The comparable uh, overheating sound for AB operation will be somewhere around uh, 70%. That gives you a 20% overheat. Maybe you go to 80%, then start sounding brittle again. So an AB uh, tube amp at 70% overheat on the tubes predicted on as on the screen will sound the same as a class A at 30% overheat. This, these are the reasons. Here are the four areas that make your guitar amp sound like it does. They could also, they could either be benefits or they could be problems depending on the application of a stereo amp, a radio output, or a, the radio power section, or the guitar amp. That's it in a nutshell. This is the characteristic. This is why things sound like they do or operate like they do. And if, when you can put numbers behind each of these areas I've shown on screen, it will allow you to make better informed decisions when you go to modify or rebuild or design your next tube amp or amplifiers using transistors. It's the same math, it's the same issues. So, with that, next time I'm going to talk about why the frequency determines the shape of the ellipse. I hope you found this video useful. Thank you for watching. See you next time.